Hi, this is David. I was on mute. That's okay. Hi, David. A little bit of a lag there. How are you today? No problem. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Well, thank you for being here. I'm pretty far away from folks, but if you hear a little background noise, I do apologize. <laughs> no problem. You sound good. So uh, with us next, we have David Boardman, CEO of Stockpile Reports, and his his presentation's uh, sort of the antithesis of the last one, which is, Will Photogrammetry Make Laser Scanning Obsolete? And uh, they have a really interesting uh, system and, and platform, uh, mostly using a, an iPhone to measure volumes and stockpile. So um, we're ready when you are. Please tell us a little bit about you and Stockpile Reports, and feel free to start your presentation. Sure. Thank you, Alex. Yes. So my name is David Boardman. I'm CEO of actually a group called URC Ventures, and our first application and service into the market is Stockpile Reports that we've been enjoying success with. Uh, URC Ventures is a privately funded company. Um, we have 3D experience from top to bottom. Our investors and board members have had commercial success with 3D reconstruction technologies uh, servicing a military context. Um, we have a great team uh, that we've put together that I want to share a little bit of information about. Uh, that's put together, again, this first app and service on top of our large-scale 3D reconstruction platform. Um, at the center, and of course, all the bells decide to go off right when I start, so you hear some nice church bells in the background. Uh, we have uh, three fantastic top-notch computer vision researchers that are at the heart of our business. Uh, we have Dr. Jan Michael Fromm, who's our chief science advisor. He also heads the 3D Computer Vision Group at the University of North Carolina. And he has a tremendous amount of research with ground-based, large-scale photogrammetry, worked on real-time urban 3D reconstruction as part of some DARPA projects. And he's also uh, done a significant amount of research into do internet-scale photo collection reconstruction uh, and doing that very quickly. Uh, the community at large in the academic world has done a lot with um, internet photo collections. Uh, Jan's specialty being looking at how to do it very quickly on a single machine. He's got a great uh, paper titled Building Rome in a Day, uh, if you want to take a look at it. Dr. Charles Aranyak um, has a computer graphics, computer vision background, and we were lucky enough to get him three years ago, where he was working at Boeing Research and Technology in uh, different areas of robotics. And Dr. Brian Clip has done a tremendous amount of work in real-time visual slant. Uh, which is important in the 3D reconstruction algorithms, and important in autonomous flight vehicles as well. And he leads all of our work on our dense 3D reconstruction. So I want to give you a sense because uh, a lot of people do see our public facing stockpilereports.com and they think, oh, that's a uh, cute little app that solved a nice little problem. They don't necessarily understand uh, the amount of technology that's gone into realizing the service of the app. But your question to me is, was will photogrammetry make LiDAR obsolete? So for some reason, I seem to be the person who gets asked that question time and time again. Um, there was an article about three years ago uh, that Sparpoint Group did where I gave a talk, and that ended up being the headline of the talk. And the topic of the talk was how LiDAR and photogrammetry work together to build powerful solutions. But the clickable headline was, uh, Photogrammetry will kill LiDAR, so I guess I get to be that guy. But today I wanted to go over uh, some of the converging trends that are really accelerating public photogrammetry in the marketplace. First of all is mobile computing. You know, compute power uh, that's powering our cell phones is also powering our drones. In the previous presentation, you saw got a good sense of that. Um, some people refer to drones as the byproduct of the cell phone wars, because basically it's a uh, putting propellers onto a cell phone uh, and getting it into the air. So this quick advance and development in the mobile technology is really powering what's capable at the point of collect. And being able to have these mobile devices uh, with a distribution network such as the app stores uh, really starts to empower some pretty impressive applications. The second major trend is cameras, mobile cameras, consumer-oriented cameras. I love this stat here that talks about uh, the number of photos we're taking approaching a trillion photos, 1.3 trillion photos in 2017. That is a lot of data. That is a lot of data to work with. 
And so you're starting to see smaller and smaller cameras with better and better quality that will provide incredible inputs to photogrammetric solutions. The new GoPros, very small, can be mounted on anything. Cell phone cameras continue to get better and better. We're starting to see wearables start to enter the marketplace. We're starting to see some nice applications with things uh, such as the Daiquiri helmet um, that has cameras on board and some computer vision processing. Imagine all of the construction workers around the industry and around the world um, gathering imagery uh, of them performing their jobs and what can be done with that. Another major trend that uh, the group here has been talking about a lot this morning is the flying cameras. And we still have uh, the traditional aerial photographers, but it's even getting easier and easier for them to put more complex sensor systems onto their planes. So you're starting to see some amazing uh, multi-sensor systems for very low dollar figure uh, getting up in the air. You're also starting to see the drones. So I can speak to your aircraft. You're also starting to see the drones become very pervasive and very affordable. Um, everything from the fixed wing covering large areas uh, to the quads to now even the micro quads uh, that even do come with cameras that we can do 3D reconstruction from. You're getting higher resolution at a lower cost for your aerial imagery. Uh, but don't forget the ground. Um, we're starting to see more and more camera systems come deployed on trucks and cars. And as self-driving cars start to make their way onto our roads, uh, you can imagine the amount of imagery that is collected as we continue to find ways to help those automobiles navigate the world. There are other uses and applications for that imagery that come off these trucks and cars as well. We're getting all these images, so how are we going to get to processing? Yes, we can do more and more onboard processing, um, but there's always benefit to be able to leverage the power of the cloud as well. The good news there is that wireless networks continue to increase in their bandwidth, and there's no signs of slowing. So we've seen a tremendous increase in the amount of megabits per second over the last 10 years and expect to continue to see tremendous growth rates. Now, this is my favorite slide because it wasn't too long ago that to build any sort of application or service, you had to go out and buy a three to $6,000 VP machine and you had to have somebody take care of that machine. And then you could open up your doors and be in business. Well, then we moved on to an age where we started to require more and more compute power, and we started to have the need for racks of computers, and we could spend anywhere from 100 to 300,000 uh, on that hardware itself, and then you needed even more skilled labor to maintain that. Well, luckily, over the last five years or so, cloud computing has really come of age, and now startups uh, everywhere are now able to basically have a large-scale data center by just entering their American Express card, and they're up and running. So for pennies per minute, you can leverage massive amounts of compute power. So the trends of mobile computing, uh, cameras in the palm of everyone's hand, cameras going into the air, cameras going mobile onto trucks and cars, uh, larger and larger bandwidth available in our networks, and more and more compute power on device as well as the cloud is laying the groundwork for some incredible opportunities for photogrammetry. So what I thought I'd do before answering the question of will photogrammetry make uh, LiDAR obsolete is give some examples of what I consider a state of the Walmart to state of the art in photogrammetry today. And you've already talked about some of these. Uh, this is what I would call state of the Walmart. Uh, when you're able to take a drone, uh, it flies in a very disciplined manner, it gets images of the ideal overlap, and it collects tens to hundreds of images some units are now pushing a thousand images, but for the most part it's in the hundreds. What you see on your screen here is an example output of a drone looking down, uh, flying over a coal stockpile. And so it may gather tens to hundreds of images and come back and do that processing uh, at the point of collect with some laptop compute power, or you may transmit the images to the cloud and generate a point cloud. So this is what we're seeing more and more of today. Uh, it's becoming more and more commonplace, more and more state of the Walmart. Um, this is going to be choppy, but we'll hopefully give you a sense of the end 3D reconstructed product from drone imagery. Alex, are you seeing this okay? I'll go ahead and continue. I'm assuming folks are hearing okay. 
Yeah, David, everything's coming through through well. Okay, next. Okay, great. And these bells should be over. <laughs> they go off at nine o'clock. Don't worry about it. Work. You can barely it's hear them on this end. On the island I'm at that has cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Uh, so the next example, uh, this, you know, start to get out of the state of the Walmart here. Now you put the camera in the air, but you let it go uh, in an undisciplined manner. Uh, so here's an example from about four years ago um, where I worked with a helicopter pilot who was flying a dam and collecting hundreds of images. Now what makes us a little less state of the Walmart is you don't have that disciplined flight path um, that most systems leverage today. And being able to use that information, again, to reconstruct uh, engineering grade assets that can be used for things like condition assessment. So this was actually a dam up in Alaska we worked with a survey company to do where they needed to deliver the cross sections of this dam to the Alaska Electrical Authority. So we're still kind of in state of the Walmart with that, but now let's go to the state of the art. Here about three years ago uh, we worked with a filmmaker, uh, David Bashirs, who was looking to create the most comprehensive model of Amalia. And here David had the vision to create a multi-camera rig that once again was put on a helicopter, not facing straight down, but facing ahead and slightly angled down, and flew with a multiple camera system over several days, gathered hundreds of thousands of images. And now you're talking about uh, getting into some algorithmic work that isn't state of the Walmart, but starting into state of the art. How do you take hundreds of thousands of images and process that into meaningful data? You can see on the screen here, this is actually the photo textured model of uh, Mount Everest. It was reconstructed, again, from those hundreds of thousands of photographs. Uh, this photo textured model was derived from a point cloud that contained over 4 billion pixels of the Himalaya. Now, I'll try and do uh, the fly-through video here. Again, we're over the webinar, so it'll probably be a bit jerky. But it'll give you a sense of the resulting 3D model, the size and the scale of the quality. Uh, that can be generated from just uh, basically a high-end, quote-unquote, consumer-grade camera. Uh, these were Nikon cameras uh, with prime lenses. So again, just generated from hundreds of thousands of standard photographs. Highly detailed, highly accurate model of the Himalaya. This leans a little bit more towards state of the art for aerial photogrammetry these days. And again, this was done, oh gosh, it's probably been two years now since this model was performed. Moving on, or should I say moving down, uh, let's go back to state of the Walmart. Let's come out of the air and come to the ground. Um, everybody's seen the example now. I think it's becoming fairly mainstream where Somebody goes out by a statue, and it's funny how people always pick highly textured rock statues for their demos. But here you can see an example uh, that's pretty common today. Somebody walks around a statue, takes tens to hundreds of images, and then processes those into a model. Let's see if we can get this going here. So these always make great demos. Um, they make great examples for 3D printers and showing what's possible, going out and reconstructing cultural heritage articles of interest or small objects. So this data today, again, a big uh, exciting use case is to go out, take some pictures, turn it into a model, and 3D print it. Um, we're starting to find more and more applications and use cases for being able to take this photogrammetric pipeline, generate 3D materials at the other end that help people solve some business needs. Moving up the chain a little bit now, working with hundreds of images. Uh, this is an example of a project where there were researchers uh, with the Smithsonian who had to pull several whale fossils out of the ground in a very short period of time. Um, laser scanning was used. Uh, on some of the fossils, but it was very easy for them to take their camera, to go out, take pictures, and then we were able to process, process this for them into very accurate three-dimensional models uh, that they were then able to use and store for future research. So you're getting into hundreds of images now, uh, much larger data sets, 
uh, much larger pixel density, uh, start to give you a glimpse into the state of the art. Um, here's a slightly different angle here. Um, I put this one closer to state of the art because here, much like the statue, going out around now building structures and taking images. But now you're starting to see more and more systems take those hundreds of ground images, thousands, and turn them into accurate geometry. We've been working one moment. We've been working on automated pipelines to take ground-based imagery from mobile phones of building structures, and then be able to automatically turn that into accurate geometry for that building structure. You can imagine there's lots of engineering use cases uh, that demand this type of model uh, for any sort of construction project or inspection or remodeling. And finally, an uh, example of state-of-the-art with the ground-based imagery, uh, we just finished this project recently where we've modeled uh, nearly 13,000 um, landmarks from around the world from 100 million crowdsourced photos uh, in six days. Uh, so a little play on building the world in six days there. Um, but it's amazing that from people's vacation photos uh, with their cell phone, their GoPros, their DSLRs, you're now able to reconstruct with incredible detail and in some cases even accuracy, landmarks that you've never been to. And they, this example of the Pantheon turned out fantastic. And it's one of the many landmarks that are hosted on our uh, video channels online. You can check those out at Vimeo or URC Ventures for some more examples. OK. So now that you've. Uh, seen some examples of what's possible with photogrammetry today in the state of the Walmart, state of the art. Uh, I wanted to share a real world uh, case study of photogrammetry versus LIDAR. And this goes to the stockpilereports.com service and application. The challenge that most materials companies face around the world, and the folks are surveyors on the call, have been in the measurement industry, <laughs> at some point in your career you've been asked to measure a stockpile. Um, it's very important to these companies. It's their inventory. You know, it's their shoebox. It's their box of cereal. It's their product that they're moving that they have to have an accurate count of. And it's very challenging for these companies, especially the larger companies. This is a profile of a typical aggregates producer, um, where there is typically a CFO who's demanding and needs a company-wide inventory to ensure they're running their business efficiently and effectively. And it's not uncommon for them to have 5,000 stockpiles spread across multiple states in the US. For some of the global companies, it's not uncommon to have uh, 50,000 stockpiles across multiple countries. It's a big challenge. Right? A lot of these companies today currently fund aerials or survey crews to measure annually, which is fantastic. They get really accurate results, and it's really good. But the challenge is, is it's so expensive, they can only do it once a year. And so what happens when they do that once a year is they end up having write-offs because they go all year long uh, trying their best to manage their inventory, uh, often based off of thumbs or estimates or by using production models, uh, which may leverage some scales. But more often than not, it's uh, somebody developed an equation based off of how many hours the facility's been running, and then they estimate how much they're producing. So unfortunately, this creates significant pain uh, for these materials management companies. And they have to find a way that they can measure more frequently, uh, more consistently, so that they can reduce these write-ups and write-downs. So historically, uh, they've tried uh, every means possible to perform inventories. Um, you know, starting here at the center, it's as low tech as people going out with walking wheels with consistent spreadsheets and consistent equations. And the challenge they've had with that, while it's being affordable and they can do it fairly frequently, it's just not accurate. They still tend to make significant mistakes. You've seen people uh, put high-precision GPS backpacks on and walk around piles or walk over piles. Um, you've seen terrestrial laser scanning, um, whether it's been truck mounted or on a tripod. Uh, companies have tried that. Phenomenal accuracy, really good results. 
um, but still pretty expensive uh, unless you're measuring a very high priced material. It's tough to justify uh, having somebody come out once a month and perform an expensive survey at your hundreds of sites distributed across the country or across the globe. Drones have a tremendous amount of uh, promise. Uh, the challenge is doing um, today in the state of the Walmart with drones is a company would have to buy a significant number of drones to be able to go out every month and hit all of their locations across the country or around the world. And they have the same challenge with their aerial um, photogrammetrists and aerial survey, is it just is too expensive and takes too long. So specifically uh, comparing photogrammetry and LiDAR in this specific use case, again, LiDAR provides an incredibly accurate result. Um, nobody uh, disputes that. The challenge is if you need to go out monthly, or some companies even would love to get out weekly, um, it just becomes too expensive very quickly. Uh, the ground-based uh, truck-mounted laser guys, um, typically anywhere from $2,500 to $5,000 to come to a site and provide the measurements. Uh, the ground-based guys are coming at about the same price uh, with the fixed units and the tripods, but the challenge is it takes a long time for each pile. And there are safety reasons that they want to keep boots off the ground and they want to get people in and out as quickly as possible. So while it's fantastic and accurate, um, it's proving expensive, re requires a highly trained professional, and it's time consuming. So the question was what if? What if there was a way that was so easy that you could train someone at every site of one of these companies, right? and the result met the consistency and accuracy requirements of the company, and the results were automatically processed and available to corporate headquarters with no data entry and no manual intervention. And if this could be used on a majority of assets or piles within a company. Well, that was the challenge uh, that we looked at uh, starting three years ago and felt that the answer was yes. And it was. We've put together a service and a system um, that leverages image processing. We provide the customers the ability to get those images from the ground or the air. Uh, the majority of clients are attracted to the ground-based solution because it doesn't require significant training. Now imagine uh, as the drones become more and more automated and more and more pervasive and easy to use, uh, the drones will become a bigger and bigger part of the solution. From our perspective, it's just another way to get pictures. But today, um, they're running like crazy with the ground. Um, we've measured uh, over 160 million tons of material with nearly 100 companies now for utilizing this service to measure stockpiles. Uh, and that's just been in about the last year and a half. Um, it is very easy to use. Uh, let's say if you can film a child's birthday party, you can measure a stockpile. Here's an example. Again, I'm sure it's choppy, but you see an, uh, somebody here that could be a scale operator, a front loader driver, or could be the uh, mining engineer, uh, just walks around a stockpile with an application it's running computer vision techniques on board to collect optimal imagery, which will then be used to generate the stockpile volume. Jump ahead here, we'll see. So what it generates at the end is that information is automatically processed end to end, and a map is created, and the stockpiles are positioned on the map, and then detailed reports are available. There's imagery that's available to support the documentation, which is always a big part when you're working with finance uh, and being able to justify and explain the measurement. Right, we have your cubic yards, we have your tonnage, you have what employee did it, how long it took. Sorry, I have a little trouble with that there. Um, so by being able to use imagery, uh, versus a laser scanner to compute volumes of a stockpile. Now you're in it, able to empower companies to take measurements as frequently as they would like um, with potentially lower skilled resources uh, without a capital investment. Everybody has a phone in their pocket. And as stated, um, images can be fed into this platform from the air. So there are clients who are processing uh, their stockpile volumes through stockpilereports.com, leveraging EBS, 
leveraging UX5s, uh, the AI Botics, and the DJI Phantoms in a fully automated fashion. And then there's also uh, clients that are using aerial imagery collected from airplanes. And so far in a year and a half of the service being live, uh, again, there's nearly 100 clients, uh, mainly centered in North America right now, mainly the United States, some Canada, um, have been selling the service uh, through a reseller in Australia. And then recently, uh, some clients in India have come online. Um, but you can see you're able to scale solutions, leveraging imagery very quickly at a global level. Especially if you're using ground-based imagery, you do not require inventory and hardware assets that need to be sold. Um, but then you also can complement the ground-based, phone-based solutions with imagery from the air as clients begin to internalize and use drones. And then also as uh, different aerial providers in different regions come online and on board. So that's an example where lasers provide a great answer, potentially even a better answer. But due to the level of training required and the cost, um, I really firmly believe that photogrammetry will win that use case uh, in the majority of, of customer scenarios. So there are a list of business problems out there that mirror the stockpile report scenario um, that we see that we're actively analyzing and considering and we're even pursuing solutions and some of, to solve some of the other business problems, um, but that I believe where photogrammetry will win over LiDAR, but it won't always win. So back to the original question, will photogrammetry make laser scanning obsolete? No, it will not. Uh, I've never changed my position on that. Laser scanning uh, is an incredible technology, uh, highly accurate. It will always have its place. Cost is coming down. They are getting easier to use. Um, but I do believe that they will serve a smaller market and industry where accuracy is king. But I do believe that the market for photogrammetry-based applications and solutions will be significantly larger than the market for laser scanning because there will be more use cases, uh, more business problems to solve uh, with that device that's already in somebody's pocket, palm, or purse and soon to be in the back of their pickup truck in a drone. So Alex, that's a lot of information very quickly, but hopefully that gives everybody an overview of photogrammetry and where it stands today with state of the Walmart and state of the art. An example of how photogrammetry has been used in an automated pipeline with ground and aerial imagery to realize stockpowerreports.com and gives some insight into the future potential as more and more imagery becomes available from the land and air. Okay, David, I'm back online. We do have some questions. If you're done, I'm sorry I was maneuvering yes. things as you were finishing up. So <laughs> I hope I didn't cut you off. Nope. All right. So one of the questions here is, which are not easy to read, they're a little scrunched up. Oh, how much does your system cost, Robert asked. The Stockpile Report solution is the only commercial offering we have right now. Um, we're exploring partnerships and opportunities around the core 3D reconstruction engine and platform at scale. Uh, but right now we sell the stockpilereports.com service as a license uh, subscription fee. And f as an example for the aggregates industry, there's different pricing for industries, but let's just say for the aggregates industry, um, it's selling at $6,000 per quarry at list price and then discounting based off of scale. For example, some aggregates producers may have a hundred quarries, so we'll, we'll discount off of that. So those are the that's the current pricing today. Um, it is public information. Uh, in another market, you'll find uh, the Texas DOT has purchased a statewide license to manage their stockpile inventories. They recently completed an inventory of nearly 2,000 stockpiles with a couple hundred DOT employees. And that license you'll find online is a statewide license at 250000 Right. Well, I mean, it would, that gives you some sense. I mean, that just seems to me that, you know, that's a fairly disruptive price considering, you know, I know what uh, these companies go through to 
you know, as an accounting issue, as you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, and as a regular measurement cost, it, it's that seems very disruptive. It, it it is. Price doesn't tend to be uh, an issue in the discussions when we're engaging with clients. <laughs> it's it's more of a question of, oh my gosh, we've never been able to measure this frequently before. Sure. How is that going to change our business? Exactly. And usually, it's a question of, well, who are we going to get to measure if it's not, you know, Jim the surveyor, or uh, Larry the mining engineer? You know, if it can be, you know, Freddie the front loader driver, you know, then that's a whole, that's a whole different way of thinking about things. And that's usually the longer part of the conversation is thinking about the disruption it creates and, and what are the new processes going to be. All right. One other question is. Um, can your system do stockpiles and pits? Does it matter? Stockpile reports is completely focused on doing piles at this point. Right. Um, you know, the process of automating a workflow to do a hole in the ground, um, very doable, very similar. But right now, we see the larger market in piles. Right. Maybe someday we'll do the voids as well. All right. And uh, let's see. We have one more question here. Um, uh, they're asking about the accuracy of the system. Sure. Well, the accuracy for photogrammetry is pretty well published, and people like to talk about pixel accuracy, which basically at the end of the day, you're going to end up two to three times the error of the size of what's ever in a pixel. But our customers like to think in terms of tons, because that's how they run their business. Sure. And they like to think about stockpiles. Right. They don't want to know the accuracy of a pixel. They want to know what's the accuracy of the stockpile volume. So we've been run through test after test after test, um, but the one that we like to use the most is comparing it to a laser scanner. So a lot of times we'll go out uh, with clients who will bring a laser scanner and we'll bring an eye muted or we'll bring a drone, right? And then we'll run measurements of a, a variety of piles, small piles, large piles, uh, simple conical piles, uh, very complex, multi-tiered ramp piles. And Unmuted. Again, Muted. Customers end up within Unmuted. studies 2 to 4% of what they come up with their laser scanner. Um, giving a specific example, again, that's published online, um, the surveyor from the Texas Department of Transportation ran a similar test of GPS, LiDAR, and the iPhone, and the end of their results was there was a 1.6% difference between the laser scanner and the iPhone. So again, Laser scanner wins on accuracy, but accuracy for many use cases isn't the only uh, definition of victory. Yeah, well, Sometimes it's uh, cost and consistency sure. and frequency. I mean, I'm not a a, a heavy user or a person does a lot of stockpile measurements, done them over the years, but that small percentage difference doesn't seem particularly substantial at all. Well, the challenge is, or I should say, the opportunity is. is when you go in there and you do these accuracy comparisons and then you go look to see what's on their books today, uh, the reality is they haven't been doing laser scanning. For the right. Most companies have not been doing laser scanning for stockpile volumes. So when they go compare to what they have on their books, um, it's not uncommon for it to be 20% different, 30% different. One company we were at, um, it was even 40% off on average from what they had on their books. So. And what do you, if you know, what, what would you estimate that the – the cost difference is there, you know, uh, in their between their accounting and, and the reality. The cost. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't completely understand the question. Well, I was just curious, you know, if they if their accounting of their materials is off 20 percent, and obviously it may make a difference on the type of material, but you know, what is the cost to them of not knowing that, you know, the the actual amount? That's a really good question, because. The biggest pain point for most companies is avoiding the write-up and write-down and adjustment to their financials, which I think is the right place for the discussion to start. Um, but you know, does that make a difference to a company's bottom line? Well, yes, it does on a spreadsheet. But I think the real opportunity still is, well, how are we going to be able to help a company be more productive right, and be able to make better business decisions off the data that really save hard money versus just adjusting a financial number up and down. But today, those adjustments, they can be in the range of, you know, for a small company, it might be, you know, 800,000 to 1.5 million. Mid-sized company, it's tens of millions. Um, 
it's not uncommon to see some of these large companies that have uh, a write-up or write-down uh, approaching a hundred million dollars, yeah. which can be insanely painful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I know. I, I met once with a a manager of a of a site, um, a gravel site, and you know, it, it just sometimes maybe it comes down to the personal level that you know he's responsible for these numbers because he's doing the measurement and you know, he just doesn't like it not working out <laughs> over time. And oh, yeah. his boss is coming back and saying, why were we over? Why were we under, you know, in the end it may come out as a wash, but, uh, well, to, you he, know, you gotta, to be fair to these guys, I've learned, you know, they're being asked, well, they're not being asked, they're being measured. Their performance is being measured on these numbers. Exactly. And that often translates to their compensation and their bonuses and payments. And, you know, unfortunately, there's just been no good way for these folks to measure frequently. So they're they're taking all kinds of actions to try and protect themselves uh, from having a compensation event in the future. So yes, you're right. You'll see these uh, site managers, quarry managers, et cetera. They you know they'll do all kinds of things to try and make sure that those numbers come out right. Um, and I, I'm sure many surveyors and folks have gone out and participated in those. Have, participate in those conversations and in my opinion it's just been you know, if you can get more frequent consistent measurement into the operations then it's going to make you know everybody's life easier yeah and I, I do think too that uh, it's it's not always first on some people's agenda when it should be but you know this is a lot safer methodology than uh, maybe not laser scanning but the old-fashioned just climbing on stockpiles which OSHA frowns upon Right. It's amazing. Uh, you know, if you would ask me what a stockpile was four years ago, I, said, you know, I had no clue. But we've learned a lot over the last four years um, going after this use case. And there's still an incredible number of, uh, you know, businesses that necessarily aren't MSHA regulated where people are climbing over piles of uh, recycling material, uh, waste, debris, um, where there's significant risk to people involved. That I think drones and other image-based technologies, phones will be able to help address safety tremendously. Definitely. Um, so where do you see uh, the future, both as business and with the industry in general, for URC and stockpile reports going? Well, we've had a much longer-term view of the market, um, and we're executing a little bit different strategy than most, and that we've always had the opinion that we need – the industry needs answers from 3D data. It doesn't need more 3D data, right? So we've really focused on how can we identify those business problems that can be fully automated end to end, right? And give people answers from 3D data. So you'll see the stockpile report solution is you know, a good example of that. Uh, and I think the industry is starting to catch up. You know, there's only so many new ways to autopilot a drone, or so many new ways to put another propeller on a drone to have it carry something different. Um, and people are making these purchases, and now they're having to justify the expense and improve ROI. And so they need these tangible ways of, you know, automating the process. You know, having something occur more frequently with less skilled resources um, that can give them business value. And so I see for our business, you know, I'm pretty proud of what we've done with stockpile reports. Um, it's the only fully automated solution I'm aware of. Um, that's image-based, uh, that's solving a business problem at this scale. And I think you're going to see, you know, more of these solutions come out from our company, uh, URC Ventures, um, and you're going to start to see more and more evolve in the marketplace as people realize, you know, the, the ease of use and the ease at which business value is derived from 3D data um, needs to increase and needs to be accelerated. Um, somebody just asked, uh, can I use uh, something other than an iPhone, a different camera? Uh, with the Stockpile Reports service, uh, we've committed ourselves to the iPhone platform for now. And I tell you, the biggest reason is um, an iPhone is an iPhone is an iPhone is an iPhone, uh, wherever you go on the planet. Um, we've looked at Android. We've actually implemented the service on Android but, but not released it publicly. 
Um, and there's just so many variations. Um, you would have to end up locking in on a specific version of Android and limiting yourself on a specific phone because um, there's so many variations in the platform and the cameras and the drivers from region to region. So far, it has never slowed us down uh, because the reality is you can now go get an iPhone on eBay. You don't need to have cell phone service and connectivity to use this. Well, that's so a good for, point, yeah. So for two or $300, you can have a measuring device. And we have a, we have a client in Australia. The iPhone isn't nearly as uh, popular in a commercial context in Australia. We literally just went out and bought 10 iPhones and distributed them to key people in the team. But they do not have uh, a cell plan. And those are now just you know three four hundred dollar uh, measuring devices. Yeah, I think people. Question, yeah, I think people would be surprised. I've done a little bit of work in this field that how consistent the iPhone cameras are, and how how really well manufactured they are. That's that's what it comes down to. I mean, yes, uh, half of our team is Apple fans. <laughs> right. Is not, but. Uh, the reality is, is they're out there, they're consistent, and uh, it really has been amazing how many aggregates producers, I mean, rock, sand, and gravel, low-tech industry, that have moved to the Apple platform and the iPhones. Um, it was really eye-opening to see the Texas DOT uh, went to iPhone. Um, more and more DOTs that we're talking to and visiting with are iPhone. It's really surprising, uh, been surprising to me. Uh, coming from a, a mobile industry background, I was expecting a lot of ruggedized devices. In these right, right. But it seems to have gone away in the past, and now it's just, hey, how can I get a device that's reliable, easy to manage, and is somewhat disposable? Well, that's the thing, right? The, the overall cost isn't that high, so in, mm -hmm. take it in perspective. Okay, is, right. is there anything else you'd like us to know about URC or stockpile reports? Um, you know, I'm very interested in uh, talking with other, you know, companies and clients beyond stockpile reports. I, I think it's a great business and solution now that we're moving into scaling. Um, but we're continuing to look for new problems to target our large-scale 3D reconstruction platform towards. We're very interested in doing that with partners who are interested in introducing new automated end-to-end -end services into the industry. So if there's anybody uh, listening in who you know, has a has, um, particular business problem they're going after with their technology but you know, needs a, a photo reconstruction platform partner, I'm interested in talking. Would this be something that it would be suitable for accident reconstruction? There are different dimensions to look <laughs> at it. Um, it. Again, it comes down to the accuracy and what you're going to need in a court case. Right. Um, because photogrammetry is, is great for a lot of things, but has a lot of weaknesses. And some of those weaknesses are, you know, shiny and reflective materials or glass and things like that. I mean, lasers has its challenges with some of those things, too. But, um, yeah, it's absolutely a, a potential for the accident scene reconstruction, especially, again, where folks aren't going to have a laser scanner at their fingertips, um, but they might have phones. Yeah, or, that's what I'm thinking about it, exactly. We've, we've actually done some interesting experiments taking, um, again, crowdsourced imagery from a specific um, accident scene and being able to reconstruct it based off of um, consumer images. So not a hired person there to reconstruct the scene, but there's often a lot of, there's a big crowd that shows up with Right. <laughs> yeah, it's not always the best, not always the best lighting, too, because you never... You know, you know no. what time of day it is. No, night. but, but yeah. when you don't have anything else um, to go on, uh, sometimes that data can be helpful. Sure, sure. All right, well, uh, people can visit uh, stockpilereports.com uh, to learn more about that service. And um, what's the best way if they want to get in touch with you, David? Yeah, I would visit urcventures.com or yeah. stockpilereports.com. And uh, reach out. You can also reach out to me directly. I'll go ahead and give out my email address. It's david.boardman, uh, it's B-O-A-R-D-M-A-N, at urcventures.com, urcventures.com. 
Okay. Uh, thank you Sorry, very much. Th that's no. okay. I fear he was coming to pick you up. Uh, that would sounded low. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank thank you for your time today. We appreciate it very much. It was a, a great presentation. Thank you. I hope it helps for some conversation. Okay. Have a great day. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye.